Direct government interference with consumption. What does this interventionist measure consist of? Well, it is quite simple. The command imposed by force from above says something like this. It is forbidden to drink alcohol. Do not be surprised. That was the law in certain countries for many years. Think of prohibition in the United States. Drinking alcohol was illegal. The production and distribution of alcohol were a crime, and consumption was too, in certain circumstances. However, mutatis mutandis, the same law, is in effect today concerning drugs other than alcohol. Drug production and distribution are illegal, and the consumption of drugs is forbidden, depending on the manner and the circumstances. The justification provided always sounds very lofty. To justify prohibition in the United States, it was argued that drinking destroys alcoholics and that alcoholism often places families in tragic situations. Broken families, husbands who abandon their wives, children who are left in precarious circumstances. Clearly such a harmful substance must be prohibited. And that is not to mention drugs or cocaine addicts or those who fall prey to heroin. Do we not all know someone whose life has been destroyed by drugs? Well, Papa State knows we are like children and do not know how to behave, so he forbids us to drink alcohol or to take drugs or to smoke. The damaging effects of smoking are quite clear. Objective studies show that smoking increases the risk of cancer. It causes lung cancer. In fact, my grandfather's brother died of lung cancer from smoking. Now smoking is banned in all public places. You have to go outside, and everybody is huddled together, smoking at building entrances, and at sidewalk cafes, and in gardens. Smoking is not permitted in restaurants, etc. Therefore, passionate, ethical considerations and goals are always superior. And the mindset is, I know better than you. And since you are not capable of doing the right thing, I will impose it on you by force, whether you like it or not. What effects does this have, strictly from the standpoint of economic theory? For now, we are going to set aside ethical considerations. That is, we will not ask to what extent a person is entitled to forcibly prohibit two adults from deciding to buy or sell a bottle of whiskey, drink it and get drunk, or to take drugs and the like. We will not go into these matters, though a lot could be said. We will analyze the effects solely from the standpoint of economic theory. Listen, unless mankind changes, as long as people keep getting bored and looking for ways to escape reality by having one, two, three, ten, twenty or thirty drinks, or by shooting heroin or whatever, and this is as old as mankind itself, as long as there is a demand, if the production, distribution and consumption of such substances are banned, a dramatic effect immediately appears. The production cost of the corresponding substances in the market, and in this case the black market, because it is illegal, skyrockets. As long as people want to keep drinking alcohol, as they did during prohibition, they will have to pay a much higher price for it. This happens now because a dose of any drug is worth very little, but on the black market it is extremely expensive. Why? Because to the cost we must add that of producing and distributing the product outside the law. The first effect is that prices soar. The second effect is that the process of production, distribution and consumption is criminalized. At that point, who takes care of producing and distributing the substances? the people most skilled at violating the law. That is, the process of production and distribution, up to the stage of consumption, is placed in the hands of mafias and criminals, and consumers come in contact with the world of crime. Furthermore, those criminals make a fortune. Because they are the most skilled at breaking the law, they sell the product outside the law at an exorbitant price, and that becomes a source of huge profits for them. Incidentally, it permits them to, in turn, corrupt the system, in order to somehow exercise a dominant influence and reach their goals. On top of that, they cannot turn to the regular law courts to resolve their conflicts. Listen, I want to file a suit against my mafia competitor, because we agreed to split up the Salamanca district between us, and he has not kept to our agreement. So please, your honor, 
I want him to compensate me, because I am the one who distributes cocaine in this half of the district, and this guy is invading my territory. Please. Criminals do not have that option. So, what do they rely on? Well, it is very simple. Gunshots and violence. And then there are people who are unable to handle drugs properly. And this is another of the most serious effects of prohibition. When people are dealing with a dangerous substance, and drugs are certainly dangerous, and I am not referring only to drugs like cocaine, heroin and so on. These are very dangerous indeed. But alcohol is also a dangerous substance, and tobacco is as well. However, in a spontaneous order, we learn, in an evolutionary way, by trial and error, how we must behave with respect to drugs. In an order of liberty, most human beings tend to learn how to handle them. In fact, in places where it is culturally acceptable to drink wine, we have learned how to drink wine. In the Mediterranean world, we know how to drink wine. We drink it with meals, and we know we can have two or three glasses of wine, and maybe a little more on weekends. And if we are at a wedding feast, then everyone knows it is a special day. There is nothing strange about this, and we have internalized it. And if you visit Northern Europe, you will find it different there too. When someone talks about alcohol there, it is as if they were talking about cocaine. Well, if I were up here pretending to sniff cocaine, everyone would start laughing. Some people would blush. What is the professor saying? Those comments people would make if I talked about cocaine here are the same comments my American students made when I brought up alcohol. In many parts of the United States, and by tradition in the English-speaking world, drinking alcohol is forbidden. It is regulated and permitted only in certain places and at certain times of day. They have not learned how to handle substances. Do you know what drinking means to young people in those areas of the United States? Drinking means taking a bottle of whiskey and downing it, glug, 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 and then another, and then falling to the floor, vomiting, and in a drunken stupor. That is drinking. They have not learned, just as we have not learned to handle cocaine, since we are prohibited from entrepreneurially experimenting with it, chewing leaves or sniffing it to find our limits. But it is not only that. It is not only that production, distribution and consumption are criminalized. It is not only that the possibility of experimenting as consumers and learning how to handle the substance is eliminated. It is also that the poor consumer, who for other reasons, the problems of life or an inner breakdown, becomes addicted, is also criminalized. And the person goes from being ill to being a criminal. If I am ill and dependent on drugs, and I need them to live, what do I do? Well, I hold up a pharmacy. I rob or kill to get my fix, when that drug dose could be obtained in a free market without robbing or killing anyone, and at a price that is a tiny fraction of what is charged now on the black market. It is not only that all of society is corrupted, as we are seeing, but that it is also corrupted from the standpoint of entrepreneurial creativity. Do you know how much effort, for instance, private pharmaceutical companies could have devoted to looking for drugs which have the effect consumers want, but not the harmful effects? Physical and psychological dependence, etc. Well, that is also prohibited. Experimenting with new substances is not permitted, and can be done only secretly in a laboratory. For years, I taught classes at the law school of the Universidad Complutense in Madrid. Many of my students were police officers, because there is a program in the police force through which officers who get a law degree are promoted. They invariably said the same thing to me. Professor, you are absolutely right. We spend most of our time fighting a losing battle when it comes to drugs. We become corrupted, and we destroy ourselves, families, drug addicts and producers, and so on, instead of devoting ourselves to defending life and property, and to keeping public order. There is a movie you have probably seen. I think it is called Traffic. You have seen it, right? Well, if not, look for it on the Internet. You will see that it is not drugs, but their prohibition which destroys society. There is tremendous hypocrisy surrounding this issue, and the resulting loss, damage and cost are also tremendous. Another movie you may have seen is called The Untouchables. 
Kevin Costner is Elliot Ness, a very proud graduate of the FBI Academy near Washington. He plans to save the world because he represents law and order. His first post is in Chicago in the 1930s. Prohibition is in full force. Until Elliot Ness shows up with his untouchables and the order to enforce the law, Chicago is as quiet as the grave. Granted, there is a law against drinking alcohol, but everybody drinks alcohol on the weekends. People simply know where to go. There are places in dark alleys, and people knock, and someone inside takes a good look at them before letting them in. Inside there is a big party going on. There is an orchestra, and people are dancing the Charleston. Everybody is drinking and happy, and everybody is there. The mayor, civil servants, police officers, entrepreneurs, the bishop, everybody. They have a great time. Of course, all of this requires barrels of alcohol. Where do they come from, since alcohol is prohibited? Well, since the Great Lakes are on the border with Canada, the barrels are smuggled in. They are smuggled in, and somebody has to do the smuggling. The mobsters take care of it. Al Capone and the different families, who make an enormous amount of money and know how to bribe the police. The mobsters pay the poor police, and all they have to do is look the other way, right when the barrels are passing. The barrels go by, and once they have all passed, the officers can look again. Everyone is peaceful. Some people earn more money, others have fun, and there is no problem. The problem arises, dear students, when Elliot Ness, FBI agent, arrives and wants to impose the law. If you watch the movie, you will see that at that point, the death toll begins to soar. The FBI cavalry even ends up attacking a convoy of cars and trucks smuggling alcohol, and a huge number of people die. At the end, Al Capone is arrested, but not for what you would expect. A disloyal employee simply reports that the mobster does not pay taxes. He is put in prison, and that is how the movie ends. Elliot Ness, FBI, is very happy after testifying. He listens with great satisfaction to the court ruling that sentences Al Capone to prison for tax evasion. And this comes after hundreds of deaths in preceding years, due to gunfights and all sorts of violence. Well, as Mr. Ness is leaving the courthouse, and the movie shows this very well, he is smoking a cigarette. Smoking had not yet been prohibited, and a child approaches, yelling, Extra! Extra! Read all about it! one of those children who used to sell newspapers for a couple of cents. Extra! Extra! Ness buys a paper, and he reads the huge headline. Prohibition has been repealed. What an intelligent measure! Why do they not take similar ones today to do away with all the laws still in force prohibiting other drugs? It would be wonderful. Then the child says, Mr. Ness! Mr. Ness! Read the news! Prohibition has been repealed! What are you going to do now? And Kevin Costner, Elliot Ness, says, Now I'm going to go have a glass of whiskey. What a bastard! After everything he has done, now he goes and has a glass of whiskey. If instead of pursuing Al Capone, they had asked this guy to go gas Jews, for instance, his efficiency would have been extraordinary. Well, the minute it was declared that prohibition was abolished, the mobster's main source of profit disappeared. Do you know who financed the lobby to maintain prohibition? Who benefited from prohibition? Al Capone and the mobsters. Who do you think has the greatest interest in maintaining the prohibition of drugs nowadays? The mafias. The moment drug production, distribution and consumption are liberalized, the mafia's entire source of profit will disappear. Drugs will be purchased at pharmacies. There will be opium smokers, like there were in the United States until 1910. It was a socially accepted practice, and there was no problem. And if someone had become addicted to the drug and was consistently out of it, that person was ill and needed a different kind of treatment. But just as there were bars and cafes, there were opium dens. And there was no problem, nor was anyone pursued by the law. Nor did girls have to prostitute themselves to get their drug fix, like we see in traffic. Nor was an entire society destroyed due to the forcible imposition of an absurd law. Notice how direct interference with consumption produces effects that are the exact opposite of those desired. A few years ago, at the beginning of this century, I gave a seminar at the Summer University of Santander on this topic, 
the liberalization of drugs. I invited the most important judges in the criminal division of the Supreme Court. With great satisfaction, I heard from their own lips that I was quite right, and they are the ones in charge of making rulings. Think about that. If my police officer students felt they were spending their lives destroying society by fighting drugs, and the Supreme Court judges who attended the seminar recognized the serious harm being done, then the conclusion is very clear. To solve the whole drug problem, we need only liberalize drugs in all spheres. That is the main conclusion we reach based on the economic analysis of this first interventionist measure. Thank you very much.